All right, so let's um, think about the idea of maximum power transfer along our transmission line. Our transmission line now has a source and a load connected to either end, and we've gone through and discussed uh, delivered power, absorbed power, um, incident reflected power, uh, particularly with respect to uh, the special cases of matched sources or matched loads. One of the questions we might ask ourselves then is under what condition do we have maximum power transfer and what condition does all of the available power of the source be absorbed by the load? Now, when you go through and look at our math and see if we can figure this out, because this is uh, a question that uh, frequently students uh, misinterpret. It's easy to come to a conclusion that's completely erroneous. So we start out with our um, our power um, accounting here, essentially. Uh, the delivered power from our source must be equal to the net power flow through the transmission line. In other words, equal to the difference between the incident and the reflected. And of course, at the other end of the transmission line, the power absorbed by the load is likewise equal to the net power flow uh, on the transmission line, the difference between instant and reflected. And so we came up with this equation. The delivered power is equal to the absorbed power, which is equal to the net power, the difference between instant and reflected power. So then we looked at the special case where we have a matched load, quote unquote, a load that's numerically equal to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line to which it is attached. Under that condition, we showed that the reflected power goes to zero. There's no reflected power for a matched load. And so now our net power flow along our transmission line, the difference between the incident and the reflected, is simply the incident power. So in the condition of a match load, we see that the power delivered from the source is equal to the power incident on the transmission line, which is equal to the net power flow on the transmission line, of course, and that is equal then to the power absorbed by the load. Deliver power is equal to the absorbed power always and equal to the net power always. But for this special case, the net power is equal to simply the incident power since the reflected power is equal to zero. Now here's where the student's logic sometimes uh, uh, goes off the track. If we have a situation now where the net power flow is equal to the incident minus the reflected and the matched load causes that reflected power to go to zero, it seems like that's the situation that would maximize then the net power flow. And since the net power flow is equal to the delivered power, that's the situation that would maximize the uh, power that's delivered from the source. And of course, the maximum power that can be delivered from the source is by definition the available power of the source. And so students come to the conclusion that when the load is matched, the reflected power is zero, the net power is maximized, therefore, and therefore the uh, source is delivering all of its available power. But that statement is completely false. All right, this is incorrect. These three, or these two equalities, I should say, are valid. This last one is not. The power delivered to the source, by the source rather, uh, when the reflected power is equal to zero, is generally speaking not equal to the available power of the source. In other words, even when the match, the load is a matched load and the reflected power is zero, we'll find the power delivered by the source will be less than its available power. So again, students are perplexed by this statement because if you look at our power balance equation or energy accounting, uh, it appears certainly that if we want to maximize this center term, make it as large as possible, we should make the reflected power as small as possible. And of course, the smallest we can make the reflected power is zero. So if we made the power, the reflected power equal to zero with a match load, why would this not maximize the net power flow and therefore maximize the delivered power. Well, the reason, of course, we talked about before is that both waves, both the plus wave, the minus wave, or in other words, the incident and reflected wave are affected by the value of load ZL. It is true if we set the load ZL numerically equal to Z0, that will minimize the reflected power, but it will also alter the incident power. What we're looking for is the load that will maximize the difference 
in these two. Every load will change these values, both incident and reflected. And so we can pick a load, ZL is equal to zero, that will drive this to zero, but we'll find that that same load will seek, will, will actually minimize the incident power as well. So that's the key thing. The incident power and the reflected power both depend on the value of gamma L. We're not looking for the load that will minimize this or maximize that. What we're looking for is a load that will maximize the difference between the two. So our match load when the load impedance is numerically equal to Z0, of course, is the load that will minimize the reflected power, minimize it all the way down to zero. But it turns out that same load is the load that will likewise minimize the delivered power. The minimum delivered power won't be zero for a given source, but <clears throat> it will be less than any other delivered power if we connect a match load to it. The reason for this really is this idea we talked about earlier with respect to our steady state solution. The power that we get for both incident and reflected is the power flow once our source has been on essentially forever. And in that case, we can look at it as being the uh, wave that propagates down to the load, reflects from there, propagates back to the source, reflects there, comes down the line a second time and a third time and a fourth time up to an infinite number of times. What happens is if the load is numerically equal to Z0, we have a match load, there is no reflected wave, and so there is no reflection and coming back a second time or a third term or a fourth term. That incident, infinite series of uh, incident waves due to each propagation uh, back and forth, uh, that infinite series just collapses to simply one term. And that's why when the load is the match load, we find that the incident power, I should say that what we find is, yeah, the incident power is, um, uh, uh, minimized as well, not to zero, but it's the smallest incident power that we have given that we're, we can change or select the value of our load in peace. So in summary, if you have a match load, the reflected power goes to zero, but the incident power is the smallest of all possible values. It could be as well. So because the incident power is uh, is minimized, likewise, when we uh, connect a match load, we find that the delivered power, the difference between the incident and reflected, uh, is not uh, optimal, uh, is not as large as it possibly could be. In other words, delivered power under this condition will, generally speaking, be less than the available power of this source. So again, if we have a match load, the reflected power is equal to zero, but the incident power is no great value either, such that the difference between incident reflected is equal to the delivered power. But again, it's not as large as it could be. We're minimizing the reflected power, but we're likewise minimizing the incident power. And so the difference between the two is not maximized. The delivered power of the source is less than the available power of that same source. So you might think, gee, let's take a different tact. If we tried to minimize the reflected power, it didn't uh, ma optimize or maximize the delivered power. Uh, how about if we instead try to maximize the incident power? We ask ourselves the question, what load impedance will cause the incident power to be the largest power than it possibly can be? Well, it turns out that solution is any load impedance that is purely reactive. And again, we can kind of see this from sort of the multiple reflection viewpoint that happens when we go to steady state. If we have a reactive power, I'm sorry, reactive load, then we end up with a uh, situation where this cannot absorb any energy. And because the load cannot absorb any energy, then we find that all of the incident power is reflected. The magnitude of gamma L for a reactive load is equal to one. And so if we have a, a, a reactive load, all of the incident power is reflected. And so that incident power turns around and comes back, reflects off the load, or I'm sorry, the source again, comes back down for a second time and a third time and a fourth time. And because the uh, reflective power is so big, each time around, it adds more and more to that incident power, essentially, in the infinite summation of, uh, of all the multiple reflection terms there. The problem is, 
it doesn't maximize the available, I'm sorry, the delivered power of the source. Why is that? Well, the incident power is large as possibly could be, <clears throat> but the reflected power is equal to it. And so the net power flow is equal to zero. If we have a reactive load here, it can't absorb any energy, which means the net power flow here must be zero, which means the net power here flow here must be zero, which means the delivered power is equal to zero. So it turns out the reactive load actually minimizes the delivered power. Not only does it not uh, maximize the delivered power, it, it results in the smallest delivered power possible, and that is equal to zero. And again, sometimes students are a little bit perplexed by this. We have a perfectly good source here with a voltage source and, uh, and an impedance, and we connect something to it, and yet there is no energy flowing across this boundary. Well, that's right, and we can see by conservation conservation of energy that must be true, because when we terminate a transmission line in a purely reactive load, the input impedance is purely reactive, which means that the uh, device cannot absorb any energy, and if it can't absorb any energy, that means the source is not delivering any energy. If the source delivered energy and the load didn't absorb it, the question is where did the heck did where did the where did the energy go? So uh, uh, again, with respect to trying to maximize the power delivered by the source, this is the worst of all possible solutions. A match load um, um, will result in a delivered power, which is significant, but as we just showed, it won't be a delivered power. Generally speaking, that is maximum. That's equal to the available power. So let's figure out how how do we um, uh, set up a situation where the source itself is delivering energy at a rate that's equal to its available power so you know in summary here if we want to uh, 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 well a match load will minimize the reflected power minimize it to zero but it also minimizes the incident power which is why the delivered power there isn't all that big a reactive load will uh, maximize the incident power, it be larger than any other load that we could uh, put on there, but it makes the reflected power just as big, such that the delivered power is exactly zero. What we want is a load attached to the end of our line that will not minimize the reflected or maximize the in uh, incident. What we want is a load that will, of course, maximize the net power flow, which is the difference between these two. That solution, generally speaking, will not be the load that minimizes the reflective power nor maximizes the incident power. Again, it, it maximizes the difference between those two values. Now, the question is, what is that load? What should ZL be if we want to achieve this maximization, if we want the delivered power of our source to be equal to its available power? Well, we've already discussed this, and you already know the answer. We know, a so we know a source will deliver uh, all of its available power only when the load that is attached to that source has a value which is the complex conjugate of its sort of the source impedance. And so this is the circuit that will bring about the case where the delivered power of this source is equal to its available power. When we take this source and we connect to it a load whose impedance is the complex conjugate of ZG. Now, this load that's connected to the source is the equivalent of this one port device. In other words, the input impedance of our terminated transmission line. What should the value of ZL be? Well, whatever value is necessary to create an input impedance here, which is the complex conjugate of this source impedance here. That's not necessarily an easy problem to determine from our transmission line uh, equations, from our telegrapher equations. Uh, this is actually where a Smith chart comes in handy if you're familiar with that. But if I know ZG, I can determine what ZN should be to extract energy from this source at the maximum rate. That input impedance should be the complex conjugate of ZG. Once I know what that input impedance should be, if I know the characteristics of my transmission line Z0 and beta, and I know the length of the transmission line L, we can work the problem backwards and try to figure out what value is ZL we should terminate this line with in order for the input impedance to provide us with the proper value, the complex conjugate of ZG. If we connect that impedance there, then we will have a conjugate match 
right here. And if we have a conjugate match right here, all the available power of the source looking this way is going to be delivered then by that source and absorbed by this load. Now, we say it's absorbed by this input impedance. What are we saying? Well, it's absorbed by the structure, the circuit that this impedance represents. Remember, this is the input impedance that is the equivalent circuit to this entire one port device, a transmission line that's terminated in some load ZL. And so the energy is going to be absorbed by that entire structure. But here's the deal. That energy, that delivered power, cannot be absorbed by the lossless transmission line because a lossless transmission line is lossless. If all the energy is being absorbed by this device and none of that energy can be absorbed by the transmission line, it means that all of that energy must be delivered, uh, absorbed by this load. For this situation where ZL creates an input impedance that's a conjugate match of ZG, all of the energy, all of the available power from the source will be delivered. Since none of it can be absorbed by the transmission line, all of that available power will be absorbed by the load. Remember, the power absorbed by the load is always equal to the power delivered by this source, since our transmission line is loss, lossless. If that delivered power is equal to the available power, then all of the available power of the source is absorbed by that load. And that's the situation we have. All right. It's a little bit unsatisfying because, uh, again, what should ZL be to create this condition? It's not necessarily an easy value to determine, but it is uh, uh, certainly something that we can determine if we know ZG and we know the characteristics of the transmission line Z0 and beta and its transmission line length. We can determine the value of ZL that will bring about this condition and thus this condition. Therefore, just in summary, what value of load impedance ZL will uh, create a conjugate match between ZG and ZN? And therefore, all the available power of this source will be delivered and thus absorbed by this load? Again, that solution depends on the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, in addition to the value beta. It depends on the source impedance, ZG, and it depends on the transmission line length. And this is the most annoying part of this. It depends on the transmission line length. We come up with a solution for ZL, which will extract energy from our source at the highest possible rate. And then all of a sudden we decide that we need to change the length of the transmission line. We need to move things closer or separate them a further distance. The transmission line length changes and now all of a sudden our load impedance is no longer the one that will create the input impedance. That's the conjugate match to ZG. We have to not only recalculate the solution, we have to have a different load impedance here. So this idea of transmission line length being dependent on transmission length is the worst news in microwave engineering. What we always want are solutions that are independent of the transmission line length. So we can insert transmission lines of any length without altering that solution. That's not the case here. Again, I'm going to talk about this idea of a conjugate match and our special cases of a quote unquote match source and a match load. Again, students frequently get these confused. It has the word matched in all those terms, but they are completely different things. A conjugate match is when the relationship between an equivalent source looking one way and equivalent load looking the other way, uh, input impedance looking the other way, those relationships of those two impedances are related by a complex conjugate. We need to have knowledge of both the source looking one direction and the load looking the other before we can determine whether we have a conjugate match. If we do have a conjugate match, all the available power of the equivalent source will be delivered and absorbed by that load on the other side. A matched load, on the other hand, is simply a load that terminates a transmission line, a load whose impedance is numerically equal to Z0. Will a match load result in a conjugate match? Well, generally speaking, not. We've already shown that even though the match load minimizes the reflected power, it does not minim um, uh, yeah does not maximize the difference between the incident and the reflected power. It does not 
maximize the power that is delivered. And let's make this point again now that we have the idea of complex conjugate to show again that a matched load does not result in a conjugate match, generally speaking. So let's say we have a load that's numerically equal to Z0. We know that if our load is numerically equal to Z0, that the input impedance of that terminated transmission line will likewise be equal to Z0. The line impedance along our transmission line, if that transmission line is terminated a load numerically equal to its characteristic impedance, the line impedance everywhere is equal to Z0, and therefore the line impedance at the beginning of the transmission line is going to be Z0. So this is the equivalent circuit that we have now. If we terminate our transmission line in a, quote, match load, we have an input impedance, which is likewise equal to Z0. But our source impedance here is ZG. This is some arbitrary impedance. It could be anything. There's no reason to believe that ZG is going to be equal to Z0. And so, generally speaking, what we find is um, the complex conjugate of ZG, of course, is not going to be equal to Z0. We don't have a conjugate match here. On the one side, we have 50 ohms, let's say, for the characteristic impedance. And on the other side, we have a source impedance, which is, you know, 10 minus J3 or something like that. All right. No conjugate matches involved. And since we don't have a conjugate match, then even though the source is delivering power at some rate, it will not be at its maximum rate. It will not be equal to the available power. Now let's look instead at the matched source. So let's say the source has a source impedance that's numerically equal to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line to which it is attached. Again, we call this the match source. <clears throat> and the question is, do we have a conjugate match or not? Well, there's no reason to believe that we would be. We have an arbitrary load. Again, we have a match source. The load could be anything, and therefore the input impedance could be anything, and uh, uh, it would be highly unlikely that uh, uh, the input impedance, therefore, would be equal to Z0, thus providing a conjugate match. So the point here being that is if we have a match source, we don't have a conjugate match. Clearly we don't, that the input impedance is, again, some arbitrary um, value as opposed to the complex conjugate of Z0, which of course would be Z0. So we've shown that if we have a match load, that does not mean we have a conjugate match. There's lots of things we can say if we have a match load, one being that the reflected power is equal to zero. If we have a match source, we don't have a conjugate match necessarily, or usually. Um, we can say a lot of things if we have a match source. For example, we know the incident power is equal to the available power uh, of that match source, but we can't say that the delivered power is going to be equal to that available power <clears throat> because, again, generally speaking, we don't have a conjugate match. Again, this is the point that uh, I'm trying to stress because it's so frequently misunderstood and misapplied. A match source does not mean you have a conjugate match. A match load does not have, mean you have a conjugate match. A conjugate match doesn't mean that you have a match source or a match load. Um, um, again, these are all different terms. They all have different ramifications with respect to the power that we see uh, of our, in our, on our transmission line, the rate at which energy flow of the different powers that we've spoken of so far. Now I want to talk about another error that students frequently make with respect to the power of transmission lines, the flow of energy along the transmission line from the source, absorbed, incident reflected, uh, available, how they all relate together under different circumstances. And oftentimes students will decide that if we have a conjugate match where all of the available power of the source is being delivered by the source and thus absorbed by the load, if we have that situation that the incident power flowing along the transmission line must be equal to the available power of the source. So students make this assertion that if the um, <clears throat> we have a conjugate match, the input impedance of the terminated transmission line is equal to the complex conjugate of the source impedance. All of the delivered power of the source, uh, all the available power of the source rather, will be delivered. And that's true. But <clears throat> the incident power, the power of the plus going wave on the transmission line will not be equal to the available power. And again, students oftentimes decide that it is. So this statement is completely false. All right. So put a big red X across it there. This is, this is not the case. <clears throat> 
So let's see if we can figure out why that is. So remember, if we have a lossless transmission line, <clears throat> excuse me, between our source and load, the uh, delivered power is always equal to the absorbed power by conservation of energy. That is always true. If in addition we have a conjugate match that um, is established between the, the source, let's say, and the input impedance uh, of the transmission line, really if we establish a conjugate match anywhere, if we divide up our circuit into two pieces and look at the equivalent source and load that results, there, if there's a conjugate match, then we know that all of the available power of the source will be delivered. And so these two, this statement is always true. If we have a conjugate match, then we add in this next equality. So the available, the delivered power is equal to the available power of the source. And of course, all that is then uh, absorbed by the load. <clears throat> now, we talked about before that the incident power is always greater than or equal to the delivered power of the source. Again, that's a mistake that students often make is decide these two things are equal to each other. But we showed clearly that the incident power is greater than the delivered power because the delivered power must be equal to the net power flow along the transmission line. And the delivered power is, or the net power rather, is the difference between the incident power and the reflected power. The power associated with the plus going wave minus the power going with the minus going wave is the net power um, of the transmission line, the rate net rate of energy flow uh, that we have. So this is uh, this inequality um, that we showed to be true. Delivered power, of course, again, is equal to the absorbed power by conservation of energy, but the incident power is bigger than either one of them, greater than or equal to. And of course, this is the problem. Well, what about the equality? Students decide the equality occurs when we have a conjugate match, when all of the available power of the source is being delivered, then we have this equality. The delivered power is also equal to the incident power. Well, remember, that's not when we have the quality. We discussed when the incident power is equal to the delivered power. It wasn't when we had a conjugate match. It wasn't when all of the available power is being delivered by the source. The equality occurred when the reflected power is equal to zero. And again, this is easy to, to, to see. The delivered power is equal to the difference of the incident power and the reflected power, and therefore the delivered power is equal to the incident power only when the reflected power is equal to zero. Now, if the reflected power is equal to zero, doesn't that mean that we have uh, have the um, uh, uh, the largest uh, amount of power delivered? Isn't that the uh, situation when we have the available power of the source being delivered? I mean, if the reflected uh, power is uh, zero, then it seems like that should be the largest. Well, we talked about that as well, that uh, the cases, the match load that causes the reflected power equal to zero is also the case that makes the incident power as uh, low uh, as uh, minimizes the the incident power, and so it is not the case where the uh, available power of the source is being delivered by the load. The case where the uh, available power is uh, I'm sorry the the case where the available power is being delivered by the source rather occurs when we have a conjugate match. And we have a conjugate match. Generally speaking, that uh, uh, we we don't have reflected power that's equal to zero. The reflected power is greater than zero, and therefore the incident power is not equal to the delivered power, um, even though the delivered power is equal to the available power. So you have to think through this, all right? And one of the key things is making sure that you know the definitions available, absorbed, delivered, ins uh, net, incident, reflected. Make sure you understand all those definitions to put these pieces together. <clears throat> so again, this is true. If we have a conjugate match, this is always true. The equality happens not when we have a conjugate match. It happens when we have no reflected power. When we have a conjugate match, it does not imply that we have zero reflected power, but it does mean that all of the available power of our source is going to be delivered and thus absorbed by the load. So putting the pieces together, this is the statement we can uh, use when we have a conjugate match. If we have a complex conjugate match between the input impedance of our terminated line and our source impedance there, then we know <clears throat> all of the available power of the source is going to be delivered by that source. And because the transmission line is lossless, that same available power will be absorbed by the load. But the incident power is going to be greater than this available power. And the reason for that is because the reflected power is almost certainly greater than zero. <clears throat>
the difference between the incident and the reflected must be equal to the delivered power. And the delivered power in this case, if we have a conjugate match, is equal to the available power. Now, one of the problems that students have with this is it seems like this violates some sort of conservation of energy. The fact that the incident power can be larger than the available power. The available power is the maximum rate of energy that the source can deliver, and somehow the incident power is even greater than that. That doesn't seem that doesn't seem like it is correct. The important thing to remember with respect to this conservation of energy is that the physical power that we can measure <clears throat> on the transmission line is the net power. The difference between the incident and the reflected power. This is absorbed, actually, that should be uh, um, reflected power. Um, Incident reflected, again, are sort of numbers we assign to the two terms of the telegrapher equations. We associate them with the plus going wave and the minus going wave. But physically, just like we can only measure the total voltage or the total current, the only power we can measure is the net power flow. And this net power flow cannot exceed the available power. In the case where we have a conjugate match, the uh, net power flow is is going to be equal to the available power of the source because the net power flow is always equal to the delivered power of that source. And so from the standpoint of net power flow, energy conservation is not violated. But the value of the incident wave, of course, must be larger than the net power flow, as we've seen if the absorbed power is not, I'm sorry, reflected power rather here is not equal to zero. And generally speaking, it is, it is not. <clears throat> Um, this is kind of like I tell students like in uh, in accounting when it comes to wealth that, uh, um, you know, you people have uh, uh, great assets, things that are worth a lot, and they also have quite great liabilities, uh, debts that they have to pay. And their net worth is the difference between those two. That's how much money they actually have. Um, you can have a situation where you have no money because you have no assets and no liabilities, and you can have a situation where you have no money because you have fantastic assets, but your liabilities are just as large, equally as large. Um, same thing with the net power flow. It may be zero because the incident and reflected power are both zero. The transmission line is not being energized, or you can have a net power flow of zero where uh, uh, the incident uh, power is, uh, you know, 1500 milliwatts and the reflected power is 1500 milliwatts. So um, the key thing is what is the difference between those two? Uh, that's what's physical and what can be measured. <clears throat> So we frequently, one last point, we frequently find the incident power exceeds the power available from the source. And this is true even when no conjugate match exists. It's, it's, a, it's a frequent occurrence that the value that we associate with the plus wave turns out to be bigger than the uh, uh, power available from the source. In my discussion, I use a lot of uh, weasel words like uh, almost certainly and generally speaking, and it's very unlikely. Uh, and all those, of course, are, are somewhat uh, equivocal in terms of the um, uh, uh, it implies that there are situations where this could happen. And uh, mathematically, that shows up oftentimes when we say greater than or equal to. Uh, usually it's greater than, but there are a case where it could be equal to. And so let's look at this idea that says if we have a match load, that that match load is not going to absorb all the available power of the source on the other end. And the argument was that uh, the match load makes the reflected power equal to zero. But that does not um, mean that the delivered power is going to be equal to the available power. We have to establish a complex conjugate match for that to occur. But we might ask ourselves, is there some situation then where a matched load will absorb all of the available power of the source? Well, first of all, we know that if we have a match load, the reflected power is equal to zero. <clears throat> and so the power that is absorbed by the load is equal to the incident power. And so the only way that the matched load could absorb all the available power of the source is if the incident power equals the available power of the source. If the incident power is equal to the available power, then and the reflected power is equal to zero, then indeed the uh, 
uh, matched load would absorb all of the available power of the source. So then the question becomes, is there a situation where the incident power would be equal to the available power of this source? And of course, we discussed this case where the available power, uh, I'm sorry, the incident power along our transmission line is equal to the available power of the source, where this is the situation. That, of course, occurs when we have a matched source. When the source impedance is numerically equal to ZG, then we know the incident power will be equal to the available power of that source. Then, if we have a match load, in addition, that uh, power absorbed by that load will be equal to the incident power, and thus the available power, if we have also a matched source. So if we have a matched source, we know that the incident power along the transmission line will be equal to the available power. So as long as we don't reflect any of that incident power, then uh, all of the available power will be absorbed. And of course, no reflection occurs when we have a matched load. And so we have, in this case, almost the perfect situation. If we have both a matched load and a matched source, if we have a match source, then the incident power is equal to the available power. If we have a match load, none of that incident power is reflected and therefore all of it's absorbed. If both the source and the load are quote unquote matched, then the uh, available power of the source is delivered. That's equal to the incident power flowing on the transmission line. The reflected power is zero and therefore the all that power is absorbed by the match load at the end. Now, one of the great things about all this is this is true regardless of the length of the transmission line, regardless of the length of the transmission line, all of the available power is absorbed in this situation. And that's what we are looking for. And the extra bonus for this situation is that it's true regardless of transmission line length. So this is really the ideal situation in microwave engineering. Uh, if we have a situation where we have both a match source at one end of the transmission line and a match load at the other end of the transmission line, we have a situation where we know all the available power of the source will be absorbed by the load on the other end. And again, that's independent of the length of that transmission line. Now you say if all the available power of the source is being absorbed by the load, doesn't that mean we have a complex conjugate match somewhere in addition? And that is definitely the case. If you look here, we have a transmission line terminated in a match load, a load numerically equal to Z0. We know in that case that the input impedance of this terminated transmission line would be therefore equal to Z0. And the complex conjugate of Z0 is Z0, which is the source impedance. And so uh, what we have here is a situation where a complex conjugate match exists, and we have created by using both a match source and a match load. So this is where all the match stuff starts to get confusing, and I think convoluted, and, and, and this is what causes the confusion in general. We have a situation where if we have a match source and a match load between uh, connected to a transmission line, then we have a complex conjugate match. It's not that we have a match load, that means we have a conjugate match, or a match source, that implies we have a conjugate match. If we have both, and only if we have both, can we be assured that we have a conjugate match regardless of the length of the transmission line. One other thing that students uh, sometimes are mistaken about this is this is not the only way, however, we can get a conjugate match. We could have a situation where a load could be some arbitrary value and our impedance could, uh, uh, source impedance rather, could be some arbitrary impedance value. Um, uh, as long as the resulting input impedance of this terminated line is equal to the complex conjugate of that source impedance, then we'll have a uh, conjugate match and all the available power of this source, the non-match source, non-Z0 source, is going to be absorbed by this arbitrary load, the quote non-match load. So we can have a conjugate match that exists without having a quote match source or quote a match load. We can't have a conjugate match if we only have one a more match source or a match load. If we have both a conjugate match, uh, I'm sorry, a match source or a match, right, a match source 
and a match load, if we have both of them, then we will have established a conjugate match and we'll have all the available power of the source delivered to the load and absorbed. And again, the beautiful thing there, it's independent of transmission line length. So make sure you go through and understand that. Again, I know there's lots of match involved there, um, but uh, uh, again, the conjugate match is different than the idea of a match source and a match load. However, if we have both a match source and a match load, then we will have a conjugate match, although that's not the only way a conjugate match can be achieved.